Welcome to week five of the Sustainable Energy module. And this week we're going to talk about energy policy instruments. So what tools the policymakers have at their hands to bring about different objectives for the energy system. And the topics that we're going to cover, first of all, very quickly, covering the emissions abatement options. So how do we actually abate carbon um, dioxide emissions and introduce different types of energy policy instruments? Then we'll go through three different types of energy policies, standards and regulations, market-based instruments, and then other policy instruments. Uh, and then a quick discussion on trade-offs and co-benefits of different um, solutions and how policy affects those trade-offs and co-benefits. So firstly, um, this is a really whistle-stop tour of how we reduce carbon dioxide emissions from our energy consumption. Um, the latter half of the course will be sort of very in-depth investigations into different types of biomass, into nuclear, into uh, EVs. So you'll be learning in-depth about different solutions, but this is a sort of a helicopter view of, of different uh, of, of, of the class of different solutions. So basically, we've accepted from um, the population growth, I suppose, study that we're not going to, re you know, be targeting population reduction to, to, to abate emissions. So what what are the other options that we have for uh, to do that? We have, first of all, a category called fuel substitution, which means replacing uh, high emitting, high uh, carbon intensive fuels like coal, and and peat uh, to low carbon intensive fuels. Of course, it's all relative. Um, gas is about half the carbon intensity of peat, but it still is a fossil fuel and emits a um, significant amount of, of, of CO2. Or you can shift from oil to biofuel in the transport sector or oil to electricity and heating. So basically shifting the, 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 the fuel that you're, um, that you're using to a low carbon fuel, that's one option, fuel substitution. Second is to make our consumption, what we need in the first place, less energy intensive. Less energy intensive is the exact same as more energy efficient. So basically doing the same with less fuel input. And the examples there are simply get a more efficient car, something that's better, a uh, better energy label, uh, insulate your home, uh, buy a more efficient appliance, like a better fridge, replace your incandescent light bulbs with LED light bulbs. Um, and a third option is to reduce or to change the nature of what we call our energy service demands. So energy service demands are what we do that requires energy. It's not, I don't require oil, I don't require electricity, I require heat, warmth, comfort, uh, light. Uh, so our energy service demands here are, are, are basically um, are, are things like that. So the th things that we can do to lower our energy service demands are to lower the internal temperatures in buildings or to set up better uh, building management schemes so that the lights go off when we're, when we're not there or, uh, or you know, we're only heating the part of the building that, that's occupied, for example. Um, closing windows and doors is another one. Uh, we can work from home and save transport fuel, use less data so that we're not, you know, contributing to a global data center electricity demand. So it's basically changing our behaviors, our demands or, or so on so that so that we we need uh less of these services that require a lot of energy um here we can rephrase option two here to main to to say basically do the same energy have the same energy services so with less fuel input so here would have the same sort of car transport service but with less fuel input um, if i had a more efficient car but in the case of reducing my energy service demand i would switch from car to bus or I'd cycle instead or i just wouldn't choose to make that that journey so basically we've got three classes of um uh, of options for reducing emissions from from energy and uh, and now we'll go into the different types of policy instruments that can be used to achieve these things so first of all introduction to policy instruments why why would we regulate in the first place and uh first of all we'll go to what maybe the the classic economists um uh, reason for why why governments need to intervene at all. So the kind of purpose of government, according to the kind of standard of economic thinking, is to intervene only when there are market imperfections. So when the free market can provide everything most efficiently in the kind of economist's perspective, uh, and the government needs to step in when there's these imperfections which get in the way of the market um, providing uh, providing the um, 
the, the, the right solution. So there's a few different reasons why, why you would say that the market might be imperfect. Uh, going back to very classical e e uh, economics, Adam Smith, um, the invisible hand um, guy. Uh, so the first reason is, is that in this classical economics is that um, the market can't provide public goods um which the market basically alone wouldn't wouldn't provide an example there is education another is innovation or energy security so if you left to the market alone um you know that these things wouldn't happen but they are good for um uh, for society as a whole um and then the neoclassical economists kind of started to describe um the concept of negative externalities. A negative externality is a negative impact of a market transaction on a third party. Um, so an example, a very pertinent example there is a, uh, is carbon dioxide. If there's no cost put on you, uh, put on the emission of carbon dioxide, um, then you, when you're so there's a transaction you buy fuel or you 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 emit, uh, emit CO two, you're imposing a cost environmental cost or whatever cost on future generations on other people uh, that's not and the cost isn't embedded in the in the um in your market transaction so sort of a, a reason from this economist perspective to, is to create create this market imperfection where that negative externality cost is not included in your um, purchase decision um later economists also found that asymmetric or imperfect uh, information um lead to market imperfections so an example there is if um uh you know i want to buy an inefficient fridge but i don't know what is the most efficient there's no testing there's no labeling um and the it's especially imperfect in terms of the market when um when the uh, when the seller knows more than the buyer so if the manufacturer knows more and the the, the buyer knows less that's um that leads to uh quite kind of unideal outcomes so this is another reason to to regulate um and another reason to regulate is when there are monopolies or when there should be natural monopolies um what's what are called natural monopolies so th normally the market operates that there's a perfect competition ideally so that if a producer can come in uh, and undercut a, an existing producer give something produce something at um uh, at a fair price um, at a lower cost, they'll undercut and they will they will bring the price down and they will succeed in the market. But there are some goods or there's some uh, benefits. One big class of that is what we call infrastructure, uh, where the market basically that that additional value of competition is not justifiable to to create that competition. So it makes sense when I talk about um, the electricity network, for example. There's only one electricity network. It doesn't. It wouldn't make sense for that to be there on the free market. So imagine that there were sort of two competing electricity networks, two sets of of, of wires and poles, and um, um, and, uh, and and you would choose which network to go on. And um, that doesn't make market sense because the sort of a huge cost of building two independent networks is not worth the competition that would that would come about. The same thing there is for the road network. So I'm not going to like choose my road network supplier. Um, so that's why why we only have one road network and these things the the they said the electricity grid and the uh, the road they're provided by the government they are funded by the government because the market can't uh, can't supply these things it doesn't make sense to have multiple companies providing these things um there are other reasons as well um um other than these sort of textbook economic reasons to 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 um to regulate here's a few of them so you know i suppose this big class of basically to ensure that societal needs are met. There's probably a more eloquent way to say that. But for example, in terms of sustainable energy, it's to pro to provide reliable, sufficient, affordable energy, which is not going to wreck the planet. That's the sort of the, the catchphrase of this module, I suppose. Um, and regulation across all the um, all parts of the economy is needed to ensure that. But what about safety, but information, um, um, about reducing inequalities, um, mitigating energy poverty and so on. So there's this is these are these different reasons for regulation, different um, different purposes. Um, the next slide there is uh, just an introduction to, to different types of policy instruments. Um, 
there's broadly three classes. So the first is basically regulations, also known as command and control um, instruments, where the government just tells you to do something. You know, it um, it uh, has this, there, we have a speed limit. Uh, we you know we we can't um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> my mind is drawing a blank. So there's no lead in petrol. Um, there, there are these basically the, the government just there's command and control kind of limits that the, the government set that you, it says that you can't that you can't uh, um, go beyond. So that's one one class regulations. Second is more market based instruments, and that's what I call carrot and stick approaches. So you know um, the government gives you a carrot to do to have environmentally friendly things or whatever desirable outcomes and as a stick it has some sort of punishment for um for uh, outcomes which you don't want it doesn't want to see um those are usually financial so it provides basically money for things it wants to see and takes away money or basically taxes things that it doesn't want to see we'll go through examples of that um for energy and then this other class are sort of wrapped up in this maybe institutional uh framework so basically government um has a big role in 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 setting sort of basically institutional frameworks in place uh to make everything happen um you know basically even the rule of law the fact that the market can operate because you know we have we have the legal system and things like that 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 are all is sort of part of policy and part of governance um but on other, other things are for example funding information and awareness campaigns so in terms of climate change making people aware of climate change education giving people information that they can take action is one is one class um you know giving people sort of the moral incentive to 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 um take action uh, another class is say voluntary agreements with industry so negotiating with industry that they will reduce their environmentally destructive behavior um or that they will reach a certain target um other big class of thing that the governments do and it's been very topical in Ireland recently is a uh, and 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 more broadly is target setting so for example setting a national objective or setting a national statement upon which you know all of other government departments and business and society can sort of set their own agendas on the basis of the the, the, the common national interest so for example right now um there is a, a a draft bill being negotiated uh which would set the national target for 2050 as being a net zero energy uh, system and we have you know we have eu governance uh, setting our 2030 targets as well land use regulations so how do we do planning permission for wind farms how uh, how can i would say an offshore wind farm allowed to kind of connect to the national grid is another one governance is very related to that and uh, instruction uh, governance for example setting up um um the climate change advisory council which is an independent advisory committee to sort of show give oversight to the government that's also a government sort of you know tool that it has is, is basically to give itself an independent oversight uh and and to set up uh, set up structures within government itself to 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 uh, monitor progress and to um uh and to set things like budgets you know um and then another another um option then is instructions for state owned organizations so we have state owned inf um organizations like the uh, electricity grid the gas network um you know we've got a lot of our transport companies are partially nationalized and the government can just tell them you know operate on 100 percent electric vehicles you know all state owned um it can say all state owned um uh, buildings need to run on renewables you know so it can just direct its own sort of resources as well Another um, example there under the target setting or the national policy policy position was um, the fact that last year the Dáil declared a climate and biodiversity emergency. Now that was mainly just a statement, but at least it's sort of signalled um, an intent in the government for for its position. Um, and these are kind of statements that then can be used later on to justify policy or justify different actions. Um, the last slide then in in this uh, section is to think about where we apply different types of policies. Um, so on what basis do policymakers choose to undertake different types of policies, you know, in, in what jurisdiction? Uh, how do we measure their suitability, for example? So just to give a broad overview, it really depends on, on a few things. 
first of all, for example, is it a stock emission or is it a flow emission? So a stock emission is something that accumulates over time, like CO2 or nuclear waste. Um, and stock emissions, you know, you, 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 tr you need to treat those differently from flow emissions like carbon, uh, like, like methane or noise. Um, policymakers need to consider the scale. Is it low? Is there like a local scale of pollution, national or global, um, or whatever impact that they're measuring? Is it stationary or concentrated? For example, at a power plant, is the you know is the source of emissions concentrated, or is it, are they mobile, dispersed like cars? Um, is the impact local? Like, is the basically is the damage related to where the uh, emission is, like air pollution, or is it diffuse and global, like greenhouse gases? Um, and then you also have to measure the suitability in terms of these uh, costs, like is it cost effective? So does the basically if you impose, a, say, a tax and you get some emission reduction, is is it the most cost effective um, um, policy that you can think of? So because every time you impose uh, a tax or a different kind of regulation, there is some kind of cost to households, to companies, to the exchequer. Um, there can be a, a high administrative cost. You know, government might need a lot of analysis, a lot of consultants or whatever to analyze the 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 uh, the policy um, that that can um, or the policy itself can take a lot of bureaucracy to administer lots of sort of paper and bureauc you know, hiring a lot of people, things like that. You have to ask whether it's enforceable or not, because there's no point in, in having a policy if it's not enforceable. Uh, are there trade-offs or co-benefits? For example, if you're putting a, a carbon tax, will it increase fuel poverty? Or if you're um, if you're kind of phasing out coal, will you have a big imp impact on co uh, employment in coal industries? Also, certainty: how how comfortable or how sure are you that that the um, that the policy will be effective? You know, do you have the analytical capacity to look at past policies, things like that? So the next um, uh, two lectures will be on, first of all, standards and regulations, and then on uh, fiscal instruments.